So we started this series. What to do in turbulent times. Thriving in turbulent times. You know, when our, when our times get turbulent, our human tendency is to look out for number one. Somebody say amen. amen. It's what we do. That's who we are. When times get turbulent, we're tempted to guard our own people. We're tempted to guard our own families. We're also tempted to love ourselves more than we love others. It was on. It's supposed to be on. Check. Am I on, Richard? I'm good. Cool. All right. So as the current chapter of world history starts closing and inching toward its end, we witness and we hear all about a lot of pain and suffering in our world. You don't have to go far before you start hearing some of it. But listen to me very carefully, church. We cannot allow hard times to harden our hearts. We are children of God. And he's got expectations for us. But sadly, the more that we hear about what people are capable of in this world, the more numb we can become of it. So, if you're not careful, friend, listen to me, you can get so exposed to the sinfulness of this world that you actually become cold-hearted. You can become so numb to the sinfulness of, the, of this world that your heart begins to grow hard. In Matthew chapter 24... As Jesus himself was teaching about the signs of the end times. Listen to what Jesus said. In verse 12 he said, The love of many will grow cold. The love of many will grow cold. You see, when the economy turns downward, when crime begins to escalate, and when the government becomes more and more corrupt, it's human nature for us to kind of hunker down. It's human nature for us to kind of prepare for the worst. We think that we got to take care of our own needs first and let other people take care of their own concerns. But I want you to hear me. If you're listening, say amen. amen. That is not God's way. Just because times get hard, just because times get tough, just because times get turbulent, doesn't mean that you can be so self-focused uh, that you're not focused on other people as well. That is not God's way. The whole counsel of God's word teaches us that we are not to be cold-hearted, that we're not to be hard-hearted, but that we are to be compassionate toward other people. So as we look at the return of Jesus Christ, and I pray that he'll find you and he'll find me loving others with the same love with which he loved us, even in turbulent times. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul wrote to a church family kind of like ours. That church family was in a place called Thessalonica. And Paul was writing to them because they were going through their own turbulent times. They were going through a real struggle in that they were being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. This was real. You think your times are turbulent? Imagine if you were under the threat of death because you were coming to church. Right? So anyway, so Paul's writing to them because they were being persecuted for their belief in Christ. And despite their trials, despite their turbulent times, Paul encourages them to be more loving than normal. They were already loving, but he wanted them to be more loving than normal and told them of the many benefits that might result from doing that. Friend, if you will turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, just a couple, three verses today. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, in verse 11, I want to share with you a portion of what Paul wrote to that persecuted church. 
In verse 11, Paul writes, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. So that, that's important, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. That passage that I just shared with you really could be read as more of a prayer from Paul to these persecuted believers there in Thessalonica. But notice what Paul doesn't pray for. Paul does not pray that they would be protected while they're being persecuted. Paul doesn't pray that they will have courage in the midst of their struggle. No, Paul asks God to cause their love and their compassion for one another and for others to grow stronger. Verse 12, he said it. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. Friend, listen to me. When you're going through difficult times, and we all go through them. If you haven't been going through one, you're probably going to go through one. But when you're going through difficult times, I want to ask you something. Do you pray for more love? Do you pray that you would love more as a Christian? I don't, but maybe I should. Maybe I should, because Paul begins by pointing out what is called the essence of compassion. You see, the Bible is filled with references to the compassion of God. In Psalm 111 in verse 4, the Bible says that the Lord is gracious, and listen to this, He's full of compassion, right? In Lamentations 3.22, Jeremiah wrote, Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. And they are new every morning. Can I tell you that your God has a great deal of compassion for you and for all of His creation. But as our world grows colder, as our world and its people grow more hard-hearted, the need becomes greater for the compassion of God to be seen through those who have received it. God wants to show his love for other people through you. Even under stress, even under pressure, God wants to show his love through you. Now, it wasn't long ago that I spoke about this kind of love that Paul is referring to here. It's called agape love. It's God's kind of love. And agape love loves for the sake of another exclusively. Agape love loves expecting nothing in return. Now, that's quite different from human love. Because I love because it makes me feel good. Right? I love because ultimately I'm probably expecting something in return, but not so with God. His love is different. His love is not an emotion at all. In fact, His love, this kind of love, agape love, is a verb. It is an action word. It promotes action. It's not an emotion. It's the kind of love that was demonstrated on the cross. It's the kind of love that was demonstrated for me and for you when God sent Jesus to die for us. And Paul wanted these Thessalonians to live lives of love. Not based on any emotion, but to live lives of love that gave and acted on behalf of other people. Friend, listen, when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we know that the Spirit of God comes to dwell and to live within us. Therefore, we are now able to love God's way. 
we are able to love with an agape kind of love for the benefit of somebody else, not just for me. Agape love is something we need to try to practice. So while the world moans and groans, while the world is whining and complaining about turbulent times, do you want to know what God's people are supposed to do? Love more. Love more. Say it with me. Love more. That's what we're called to do. Love more. Now, Paul had already been bragging on these Thessalonians about how much they loved. He had already bragged on them many times, but he wanted them to increase their love. He wanted their love to increase more and more. Just look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In verse 9, Paul wrote, wrote to them saying, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so to all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, Love, let your love increase more and more. It's like there was no end to it. We are called to love more and more. Friends, let, let's let our love not grow stagnant. Let's never let our love be satisfactory. Let's not be satisfied with how we love. Let's let our compassion for the hurting increase more and more. Let's let our compassion for the lost increase more and more. Let's let our compassion for those who are hell bound to increase more and more. But then Paul addresses the expression of compassion. Paul told them, hey guys, here's to whom you're to express compassion. Here's to whom you're to express compassion to one another and to all. To one another and to all. Now in John 13, 34, Jesus had already told us this. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. The, the question that goes without asking is, okay, Jesus, how do you want me to love one another? And he said, listen to me. As I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, you and I know that followers of Jesus are supposed to love each other. Right? We find it very easy to love one another in the church setting. It brings me great comfort to know that you have to love me. Amen? Even when I'm unlovable, you have to love me. I'm your brother. You have to love me. But the world notices this. The world notices church buildings. The world notices how churches squabble and disagree. The world notices all these things. The world notices the sins that we point out while we're harboring sins of our own. The world notices all that. But here's one thing that they should never be able to say about the church. Man, they don't love their own people. Let no one ever be able to say that Bethel Baptist Church's members don't love one another. Because that's not the truth. But listen to this. Notice what Paul tacked on. Not only one another. And to all. And to all. He said, in addition to loving your brothers and sisters in Christ, you have to love those who are outside the church. Love to all. Love those who persecute you. Love those who are corrupt. Love those who criticize you. Followers of Christ love even when we're treated badly. Let us love one another and let us love all. But you know what? You and I are not really inclined to love that way, are we? I mean, somebody treats me bad, I'm cutting them off, man. No more love for you. Amen? This is kind of the way we think. That's human nature. But we're called to be different. See, this kind of love that we're called to love with only comes from God. It only comes from God. And that's why Paul is praying to God and asking God that he would increase his kind of love 
in these Thessalonian believers. A love for one another and for all. See, expressing the essence of God's unconditional love is a key to you and I thriving in a turbulent time. When your days are going bad, when times are tough, the best way that you can uh, thrive through that and make it through that is just love more. Just love more. But Paul also wanted to give these Thessalonians a good example. He wanted to give them an example of compassion. So what he did to provide an example of what it meant to love that increases and abounds. Here's what he did. He used his own love for them as an example. At the end of verse 12, he said, just as we do to you. You guys increase and abound in love to one another and to all. Just as we do to you. And here is how Paul demonstrated his love for these believers going through turbulent times. First of all, he thanked God for them. If you'll go back to the first chapter of that book, 1 Thessalonians, in verse 2, Paul says, We give thanks to God always for you all. Now I got to ask you something, y'all. Do you thank God for people? Do you thank God for people in your life? Family, friends, strangers, enemies? What about those that are unlovable? You thank God for them? Be honest. Don't you put on your righteous hat to be. Amen. I know better. But we're called to thank God for people, even when they're unlovable. But Paul didn't stop there. He also uh, exemplified, demonstrated his love by making mention of them in his prayers. Notice there at the end of verse 2, he said, making mention of you in our prayers. Let me ask you this. Do you pray for people? Let's be honest. Do you pray for people? How about those people who are giving you a hard time? You pray for them? Maybe you should pray extra for them. Amen. Well, Paul thanked God for them. Paul prayed for them. But also Paul preached the gospel to them. In chapter 2, in verse 2, he said, But even after we had suffered before, we were spitefully treated in Philippi. As you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you, listen, to the gospel of God in much conflict. See, Paul was willing to risk his life that those believers might have an opportunity to go to heaven. Are y'all willing to risk your life that somebody might have the opportunity to trust in Jesus and go to heaven? Paul said, that's the way I love. That's the way I show my love. That's an example of my love. I mean, friend, how often, how often do you make mention of Jesus in your daily conversations? Don't answer that question. How often do you speak the name of Jesus in your daily conversations? Is there anybody that you know that you would really like to see in heaven? And I tell you, you might want to begin by mentioning the name Jesus in your conversation. I'm just saying. Paul showed his love by thanking God for them, praying to God for them, and sharing the good news of Jesus with them. But Paul also said that he was gentle and kind and considerate to them. Think about how that, what kind of difference that might make in a stranger. If you're kind and considerate and gentle with them. In chapter 2 in verse 7 and 8. Paul said, we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives 
because you had become so dear to us. You see, Paul viewed himself as kind of a spiritual daddy to these Thessalonians. And being a spiritual daddy, he was willing to do whatever it took to make sure that they knew he loved them. I've often said that the children at Bethel are my spiritual grandchildren. And man, there ain't a thing in this world that I wouldn't do to show those children that I love them. That's not just a pastor's job. It's just not the calling of a leader or a teacher. No, that's all of our jobs according to what Paul is teaching us today. I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago that we had 46 children and youth here at Bethel Baptist Church on a Wednesday night when they could have been out doing who knows what. Well, it's my opinion that those 46 kids need spiritual parents almost as much as they need biological parents. And you're invited to come and be a spiritual parent just to show those kids a little bit of love. It comes natural to you once you just come and do it. So Paul was gentle and kind and compassionate, considerate to them. But notice also that Paul sacrificed for them. Back in chapter 2 and, and verse 9, he said, For you remember, brethren, our labor and our toil. We worked hard for you. Laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. And we preach to you the gospel of God. You see, when you have a love and a compassion for people that's increasing and growing, uh, it's not just something that you say. That kind of love is something that you do. It is action. You show them that you love them. You show them that your love for them is increasing and abounding. And often that shows itself in sacrifice. The leaders of our youth group, sacrifice. Y'all, I have seen pictures of Kids camped out in their living rooms. I've seen pictures of them with uh, 30, 40 kids at the Loretto swimming pool. Uh, I've seen pictures of them sacrificing to show their love. That it's not just something they say. It's something they do. It's something that they show. And so I pray that you'll be a lot like them. That you'll be a lot like Paul because... Paul was thanking God for them. Paul was praying for them. Paul was sharing the gospel of God with them. He was being a spiritual daddy to them, but he was also sacrificing for them. Sacrificing their time, his time, his resources, his energy. All so that these Thessalonians would witness him loving them with a kind of love that increases and abounds. A kind of love that goes beyond the norm. Above and beyond. What you and I would call love. But Paul also wanted to reveal. What the benefit. Of having this kind of love. Would be. He said. I want to show you. The effect of compassion. And if you'll go back to chapter 3. Verse 14. Paul said. So that. Key words there. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Paul says the effect of increased love, increased compassion toward others is so that, so that Jesus may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Holiness. Now those words so that are important because they show the purpose for that kind of love. See, one way to become like Jesus, which should be your goal and mine, is to do what Jesus did. 
One way that you can become like Christ is to do what Jesus did. Not come clock in on Sunday morning, clock out on your way out, but rather actually do what Jesus did all throughout your week. To love and let that love abound and increase. So what is that? Reaching out to others is obviously one way that you can show that agape love and compassion for people. Reaching out to others. And Paul said that when you do that, you are established blameless. Or at least you will be when Jesus comes back. That's important. The more we do what Jesus Christ did, the more our life will look like his. Y'all hear me? The more we do what Jesus did, the more our life will look like his. His, and we should be focused on that. Now listen, friend, it's not about how you feel. Jesus didn't always feel like letting his love abound for Judas. Jesus didn't always feel like loving Peter after those denials. Jesus didn't always feel like loving Bill Barlow after all the stunts he's pulled in his life. You may not want to love, but the child of God, the disciple of Christ, chooses to love as Jesus loves. It's really just a matter of an intentional, deliberate act of obedience. I'm going to do it. Even though I don't feel it, I'm going to love them the way Jesus loves them. So finally, I want you to consider exactly how we might actually increase and abound in love. Listen to me. There is a definite relationship between doing good and feeling good. Amen? Good relationship between doing good and... And feeling good. It is a scientific fact that helping others and doing good for others is good for your health. It is a scientific fact that doing good for others and helping others actually reduces mental and emotional disorders. It's about time that science caught up with the Bible. Amen? That's a fact. You see, God would never tell you to do something that was detrimental to your, to your well-being. He would never tell you to increase in love, to increase in compassion, if it was something that was detrimental to his glory. No, he tells you that because it's good for you and it promotes the glory of God. Now, I've told this story a time or two about a state trooper that was so mean he would give his mama a ticket for going 56 and a 55. Well, one morning, I'm leaving for work, and I kind of coasted through this stop sign. Well, that trooper was parked just down the street watching that sign. Well, when I got up to him, he jumped out of his patrol car, ordered me to stop, and started getting in my grill about not stopping at that stop sign. Y'all, we weren't having a conversation about stop signs. He was chewing me out. And after he finally hushed and went ahead and gave me my ticket, I got to tell you something. I was so mad. I was angry absolutely infuriated. I may have deserved that ticket, but I didn't deserve to be treated that way. I didn't deserve to be talked to like that. And I got so mad, you know, want to know what I did? You want to know what I did? I pulled in the very next driveway and I prayed for him. And I don't know if that prayer changed him. And I don't know if that prayer helped him at all. But can I tell you that it sure did make me feel better. 
But I wonder how much more might a more serious and more sacrificial act of kindness really have helped my beloved trooper friend. Maybe I could have gone to Krispy Kreme and bought him some donuts or something. <laughs> At prayer time, it may not have helped him, but can I tell you that it changed me? Because now, every single time that I see an officer who has pulled over a car, See, it, it may not have helped him, but it changed me. And when we turn our turbulent times into opportunity to love others, then I think that maybe we start growing to be just a little bit more like Jesus. So whatever you do, when you're going through those hard times, and listen, y'all, they're coming. The Bible's clear they're only going to increase as times grow short, when those difficult times come, when those turbulent times come your way, don't grow cold. Don't grow hard-hearted. Instead, be more compassionate. And do it until Jesus comes to get you. As sinners, we are told to come to Jesus just as we are. If we will come just as we are, he will make the necessary changes in us so that we can be used to glorify God. He just says, come. You come, I'll fix you up. And even after we're born again, even after we're saved as believers in Jesus Christ, how many of you know that we're still under construction? A whole lot of work to do in this one. But one change that God will always make in us as believers in Christ is the ability to love more. If you think you love it already, God wants you to love more. And the Holy Spirit is always working in us to increase and help us to abound in love, not only for our brothers and sisters in church. Y'all are easy to love. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Some of y'all liars too, but that's okay. <laughs> but not only for our own people, but for all people. Abound and increase in love. Even grouchy state troopers, somebody say Amen. You know, many times in the Gospels, the Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion. It doesn't say that Jesus felt compassion. It doesn't say that he had compassion. It says that he was moved with compassion. And that tells me and you that compassion is a verb. It's an action word. And if compassion is truly action, if true compassion is truly action, then the question begs to be asked, how are you acting today? Are you moved with compassion for one another and for all? I tell you that if you're not, God wants you to be. And that should be a goal. And a dream that we should have. You see, according to this word, according to God's word, the result of expressing God's love in this life is blamelessness in the next. I didn't say it. Paul said it. That's the result. And I'm so glad that God was moved with compassion for me. Y'all, I was a wreck. An accident waiting to happen.
But God was moved with compassion for me. So much so that he demonstrated his love for me. And he demonstrated his love for you. The Bible says that God demonstrates his own agape love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, still rebelling, still cussing, still uh, rebelling against God, still turning my back against God. While I was still ignoring him, Christ died for me. And he died for you too. And the good news is that once we come to Christ, the Bible is clear that we are justified. Y'all know what that means? That means you're not called guilty anymore. No more guilt. You're not guilty anymore. You're justified. And that happens by the blood of Jesus Christ that he gave up, he shed on the cross so that we might be saved from God's wrath against sin through him. Friend, I pray that today, just like me, and just like every other person in this room, every person listening in, that if you haven't come to Christ today, if you haven't been pronounced not guilty, that you will today. God's desire for you. And then once you come to him, woo, y'all, it's going to be good because he's going to make you increase. He's going to make you abound in love, not only for me, <laughs> not only for each other, but for all people. And that's good news. You just come. Let me pray for you. Father God, you're amazing. And I thank you that you would even want us to come to you. I thank you for the priceless gift of your only begotten son, Jesus. And Lord, I pray in the mighty name of our King, of our Savior, Lord, that if there is anyone here today that needs to come to Christ on his terms, just come believing by faith. I don't know it all. I don't know a whole bunch of the Bible. All I know is that I am convicted today that Jesus died for me. And I don't want to be guilty anymore. Father, if there's one person here, you would like to have that proclamation name made to them. I pray that you would encourage them to take one step of faith out, one step of faith forward. And Lord, you just take all the rest of the steps. And I'll show them how this word, your word, the Holy Scripture of God, Lord, would show them how they can be saved just like many, many others in this room. Father, thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you for loving us uh, in such an incredible way. Help us to increase and abound in love, not only for one another, but for all. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's sing.